everybody, this is Dan with Pain Free You, and I'm pleased to have yet another success story video for, for the whole community. I've got today Rebecca Tolin, and Rebecca's from the San Diego, California area, and uh, like me, she's had 13 years of pain, and I'm going to let her tell a little bit of what she experienced, what that journey was like, because the point here is, even though she had 13 years worth of pain and I had the same the message here is it doesn't have to take you that long because you're getting the cheat sheet when I went through it this was before Facebook YouTube podcasts there weren't that many books there weren't that many coaches and experts and right now you've got so many resources available to you and uh, it's not going to take you 13 years to get better so that's kind of my take on the whole 13 year thing because people are like, oh my God, 13 years. I don't even want to listen to this. I've been in it three years. I don't have another 10 to get better. I just want to dissuade that fear right off the bat that you're getting the cheat sheet with me, Rebecca, with the videos I put out. Uh, Rebecca is also a coach, helps people out with the mind body type of symptoms. So there's so many resources. Please don't fear. A long recovery time frame. It doesn't have to take that long. So with that, Rebecca, thank you for uh, being willing to talk to my audience and share your story and uh, kind of introduce yourself and kick into your story however you see fit. It's a free flow conversation. Yeah, so great to meet you, Dan. And I always tell people the same thing. When you find this knowledge and information, that's a turning point. It took me 13 years to get better because I really hadn't found it. Interestingly, I had read Healing Back Pain by Dr. Sarno sometime during my 13 year healing journey, but I had chronic fatigue syndrome. So my main symptoms were uh, fatigue, exhaustion, weakness. There was body pain, but it wasn't specifically back pain. Um, brain fog to the point where I couldn't even remember a friend's name or a colleague's name. I, I couldn't concentrate. Um, there was a lot of digestive issues and just really an, an inability to function. So for me, um, the symptoms did start after a really traumatic event. I was in Asia and um, I experienced an assault. And after that time, I got really, really tired and it was just, it was hard to do anything. And I went through about a year of trying to kind of push through the symptoms. I did go to different doctors and they, they couldn't find anything. I wasn't really in touch with the effect that this um, sexual assault had had on me. I was still able to work. I was a, an active TV news reporter. I you know, was still working full time, um, but I was dragging. Then it worked out a year later. So this would have been in 2006. I ended up going back to Asia. I already wasn't feeling that well. Now what I know about sort of learned associations, I can see why this was just sort of a perfect storm for me. Went back to Asia caught these three colds in a row and my whole system crashed after that. I actually got a, a urinary tract infection on the long airplane back. I had these colds and it was after that point, I literally couldn't get out of bed for days. Um, then I got to the point where I, you know, I could walk around the house, but I really couldn't work. Um, you know, I was a broadcast journalist and I, couldn't go back to work and insomnia was another really intense symptom. So there was this sort of tired and wired feeling 24 seven, basically just everything went, went haywire. Yeah. And so, as you can imagine, that was, that was terrifying. Um, and like, like all of us, I went on this quest to try to, to try to solve it, to try to find the right pill or the right therapy. Can I just and, jump in real quick? Yeah, please. Um, for the folks who are watching, my very non-scientific, non-medical explanation for the fatigue, I, I kind of joke that the brain goes, holy cow, life is way too intense. Go to sleep, take a nap. Yes, absolutely. There's all sorts of physiology yes. behind that, but I think that's the case. Uh, three colds yeah. in a row, UTI. Well, when we're under a great deal of stress, our immune system and our digestive system 
is massively suppressed, which can allow things like colds and UTIs to take place. When normally, if we were not very stressed out, the immune system would work better. Um, yes. So these things yes. all make sense given your prior trauma going back to, you know, Asia. And so, like you said, perfect storm kind of uh, yes. ripe to happen. So I'll let right. you go, but I just wanted to throw those couple things in for anybody watching that these are often what goes on when you are in this high state of stress, trauma, and perceived danger. That's absolutely it. And, and I, and I do feel like my whole system felt like the world is unsafe. The world is completely unsafe. So I'm just going to keep you inside the house where you can't go anywhere. Absolutely. Yeah. That's the way this stuff works is mind body stuff. It's your brain is your best friend. It's here to keep you safe and protect you at all costs. And sometimes the best way it can keep you safe is to keep you in bed. That's it's, it's it. Counterproductive, but you know, that's the way it, it is. Your brain's not torturing you, punishing you. It's here to keep you safe. And sometimes it's a little maladapted because we're saying this is not safe, but. Yeah, well, exactly. From a survival perspective, it, it does make sense because our brain interprets physical threats the same as psychological threats. And although the physical threat had passed, it was perceiving all these psychological threats going back in the world. Um, the assault that happened to me happened to be with somebody that I had worked with, wow. even though it was in another country. So, you know, work was associated with danger in my subconscious mind. Now, of course, I didn't realize this all then. And so instead, I went to integrative doctors, allopathic doctors, uh, naturopathic doctors, and, and they all diagnosed it as chronic fatigue syndrome, CFS ME, post viral syndrome, Epstein Barr syndrome, sometimes fibromyalgia. You know, and then over the years, they come up with all these ancillary diagnoses like leaky gut syndrome and candida overgrowth and all these things. But, you know, I remember pretty early on, doctors said to me, there is no cure for this. Um, we don't know the cause and you're going to have to live with it. And that actually really set the stage for me. And unfortunately, I, I believed them. Um, I even, a family member even flew me across the country to Pennsylvania to see a, even a natural path who specializes in CFS. And, and he pretty much said the same thing. And I thought if even a natural pathic doctor is saying this, um, you know, I'm really just gonna have to live with this. Now, there was a part of me that always knew, like there's there's gotta be a way to overcome this. But there were times I would really lose touch with that because I felt so sick. I was scared. Um, and so then I went on just this, this odyssey for 13 years of, of course, like all the, the, the supplements, the diets, the, I even did antiviral um, IVs in my veins, which actually just put me back months, um, vitamin IVs, you know, all kinds of um, Ayurvedic treatments, enemas, uh, everything you can imagine. I went to healers, about 50 practitioners over a 13 year period. And at some point I did start going to psychotherapists. I, I went to a trauma therapist and I think that was getting a lot closer to the root of the issue. Um, but that didn't really move the needle either. It was helpful to talk about the trauma and to sort of unpack that. But I think the dilemma there is that you have, you know, psychology and medicine and they're not connecting the two. This is actually the exact same thing. Um, and so the psychologists I saw weren't the helping me connect it. The one point. Yeah. The mind and body are not connected. They are one system. Yes. It's not just that they're connected. It's yeah. one system. You can't separate them. <laughs> So. Yeah, absolutely. It's all it's all part of the same. I mean, there are all these different parts of us are communicating and interconnected all the time. So, um, yeah. So basically, I just went on like that for so many years. I was spending hundreds of thousands of dollars. I had lost my career after about a year. They couldn't keep the job open. And I, I knew I wanted to be a journalist from the time I was in sixth grade. I loved it. I worked for PBS at the time. I covered science and nature. So I lost that. And um, I went on disability at some point. 
actually it took years because I just didn't want to acknowledge I was disabled, but I was losing my house. I couldn't support myself. What I realized looking back now is there was a lot of other losses that contributed to the symptoms because there were so many social stresses. Um, four close family members actually died during the next five years, including my father, who I was taking care of the best I could. Um, so all these things were actually exacerbating the symptoms because there was just so much underlying emotion and, uh, and conflict. But again, I was still pretty much looking at it as a physical thing. Now, I was a yogi even before the CFS. And so I had practiced yoga. So I did continue. And all I could do is like restorative poses on the floor. But I would stretch and I would notice, you know, I just feel like a little bit of relief. And then some years in, I started meditating. I started practicing uh, transcendental meditation. And I, th of course, I thought that was going to be the thing because a lot of people get better from insomnia and things through meditation. But it didn't resolve those symptoms. But whenever I would meditate, practice yoga, um, I was listening to Eckhart Tolle a lot and reading different you know, self-discovery books, I would just feel more at peace. And I would notice that's, that's interesting. This is my favorite time of the day. You know, and over the years, sometimes I could go out of the house and do little things, although I still couldn't, couldn't work. Sure. Um, so I then got to this point and I'm kind of a slow learner. And like you said, this wasn't all readily available, um, back then. So it took probably about 12 years before I just kind of surrendered. And I would say some sort of surrender happened to me. There was so much angst associated with being on this roller coaster of going to the next healer, the next person that was going to cure me or fix me that finally there was just this sort of surrender, like I'm letting go. And actually it did happen after this, <laughs> this practitioner I went to, this practitioner who was supposedly a shaman and basically was smoking her pipe and um, had asked me about the trauma I went through. And I started telling her and I started crying. And then she started talking about her cat, dressing up her cat for Halloween. And it was just this very strange, abrupt behavior. And I kind of froze up. I became really numb because I, it, it had kind of opened up that wound. And I remember she said, oh, it's, it's $200. And I wrote out the check and I was just really kind of frozen. And I left there and I just realized like nobody else has the answers. This is ridiculous. <laughs> you know, going to this woman acting this way, charging me this money. And that was, you know, I thank her because that was the last straw of really giving my power away. Wall. Yeah, you hit the wall and said, I just, I can't keep doing this. Well, I, I love that what, metaphor. What? I love that metaphor. I think of it as like, I banged my head against the wall, you know, 99 times. And the hundredth time was like, nope, like that's not working. I hit the same. Yeah, I just finally said, yeah. no more, can't do this anymore. Uh, had to fire a physical therapist that was trying to untwist me because I was very crooked. And I finally had to say, I'm done. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I have to stop trying to fix myself. I'm just going to do what I want to do, whether I hurt or not. And I just started wow. focusing on that. And um, I got out of story mode because, you know, a lot of the journey was journaling and writing and expressive writing and all this emotional discovery. And I was like, let me just get away from the story mode and just feel emotions. So what yes. am I feeling? Let me sit with the emotion, not necessarily the story behind it. Yes. So getting out of story mode, stop trying to fix myself and just shifting focus to living life. I think it was yeah. just really like an acceptance, surrender, acceptance, same thing, pretty much like, okay, this is where I am. I'm not going to spend the rest of my life just being down on myself because this is where I'm at. So let me just focus on living my life. And over time I started getting better. So we had a similar timeline and trajectory. So, because actually that's very similar to that sense of just, okay, I'm going to just enjoy what I can. Now I couldn't do much outside of the house. I mean, I could do a little bit, but but it didn't matter anymore. I would just, you know, go out in the backyard or I could go to, to a local nature preserve and I would just stare at the leaves and the trees and I would listen to the water and the stream. 
And I started falling into this deep peace. You know, like I said, I was listening to Eckhart Tolle a lot. He was the soundtrack of my life. And he's all about being in the moment and peace. And something shifted before that 13th year where I felt completely okay in my mind. There was peace of mind with my life and even with my body. And Dan, what was so interesting was that went on almost a year where I still had flu-like symptoms. With CFS, it's like having the flu 24-7. It can be quite extreme. Um, But I was at peace with it, and it was really fascinating. And there was this like realization that happened in that year that outer conditions, even health, relationships, jobs, they don't make us happy. There is an inner peace. There is something that you can find inside of yourself that's okay in this moment. So I lived like that for almost a year. And what I found that propelled me to take an online writing class, because again, I wasn't really going out to classes, um, but it was with a woman named Martha Beck. And I love this class. And I met this community of women. It was all about like expressing our inner truth. So there's some of that like emotional work. Um, But interestingly, so when I sort of gave up the fight, gave up the fixing, the frustration, all of um, Howard Schubner's five Fs. Then what happened is I met this woman in the class and she said, you know, I had really severe CFS and I recovered through this work from Dr. John Sarno. Do you want to set up a phone call? And I was like, you know, I can talk on the phone for about 10, 15 minutes and then I get a migraine. <laughs> I mean, I was still there. So, so I was like, yeah, we can, if we can talk for, yeah, if we can talk in, in a short bit. So um, three hours later on this phone conversation, <clears throat> I was just filling with energy because she was explaining the work of <clears throat> basically Sarno and Schubner, but she was saying, you know, well, I know these symptoms are real, but they are happening in your brain and in your nervous system. These are just learned neuro circuits. She explained she went through it for almost the same number of years and she fully recovered. She talked about the science. I love science because I was a science reporter for PBS. And um, I got it. By the end of that conversation, she said, Rebecca, you are not sick. And those four words changed my life. They somehow just sunk in on the deepest level. I said, I am not sick. And and Dan, I am not kidding. Everything shifted in that moment. My body went into just energy. I was pulsing with a sense of aliveness. I actually got up. This was in the winter of 2018 at night. And I started running around the block. Now I hadn't ran in years. I just felt like she had handed me this get out of jail free card. It was like, wow, I get what's happening and how this all happened right. and that I can I can unlearn it. Um, now, that was not the end of the story. So for people oh, who clearly. say, oh, wait, I don't have, you know, I didn't have a book here or talk to someone and get better. I've had to work at it. Um, let me assure you, I, I did. I did have to work at it. So then what happened is like for about the next week, I felt miraculously good, not not normal, but a lot better. But then symptoms started coming back because there's all those learned neural pathways. And my brain really did still think there was all these dangers in the world. On top of the fact that all these doctors had convinced me I was weak and broken. Viruses had invaded my brain. I was allergic to a hundred foods. Like I had been hearing that for so long, you know, that those were all kind of learned um, thoughts as well. So I knew that this was the path though. I was a hundred percent sure, maybe 99% sure per your recent video. Um, This was the path and I wanted to work with someone. So I hired a, a mind body coach, Jim Prusak. Okay. Who actually came right to this room for about eight months, and he's wonderful. And um, we we really just worked on you know the knowledge, a lot of somatic meditation. So you talked about just feeling emotions and being with sensations, and that was a huge part of my recovery. So for me, I would say it was the knowledge and really steeping myself in it, reading Sarno, reading Schubner. Alan Gordon, listening to you, listening to podcasts. Um, 
And then really being with the felt experience of these really uncomfortable sensations. And often when I would do that, like fatigue is, what is it? It's heaviness or like I had all this burning and kind of tingling in my limbs when I would be with that through this lens of safety, it sometimes would shift into emotions, you know, and, and anger would come up and even some memories would come up and then it would start to dissipate. And I felt like I am interacting with the raw energy of the symptoms, the so-called illness. So I did that for months and I, I loved it. I still practice somatic meditations before bed just because I, I like to come back into the body, even though I feel really good in my body for the most part. Um, and then, you know, I started challenging all those triggers. So that was that was tricky because I perceived everything as dangerous. Talking to someone, eating, working, sleeping, not consciously. You would have met me and thought I seem like, you know, a well-adjusted person. I wasn't living in paranoia, but but subconsciously. Um, so I just started challenging all that. And I would go like meet a friend for tea and I'd have all these symptoms just from that. But I was like, great, I can really train my brain that this is safe. When symptoms come on, it's an opportunity to just be mindful, be present, send these different messages. You know, I was constantly talking to myself. I am not sick. I am not broken. I couldn't quite go to I am healthy. I am not sick, I could believe, um, but I'm safe. My brain is just creating these sensations. I'm okay. My body is okay in this moment. Emotions are welcome here. And I accept the sensations that I'm feeling right now. Yeah, and I um, slowly but surely started moving out in the world again. Yeah, the resistance to the symptoms keeps them, keeps them going because we're That's like it. running away and running away. and all that does is keep you in that high state of stress, fight or flight. And, you know, the brain and nervous system is not going to really calm down if you're in that mode of resistance, freak out, fear. Ah, oh, my God, I got to get out of here. Right. And exactly. that's, what, that's what causes yeah. so many people to say, well, that was a trigger. That was a trigger. That was a trigger. So let me eliminate those triggers. And before you know it, you don't leave your house. That's it. And then you get to the point where it's like, what am I even living for? You know, if I don't leave my house, what's my reason for being? What's my meaning in my life? And I think that's really key. And I heard you say that, Dan, that you started just living your life again. And even though I was physically limited, I started living my life again prior to the, the TMS breakthrough. And then after that breakthrough, yeah, I really, I, I would even go out in the evening to meet a friend for dinner and I would have insomnia all night. And then the next day feel like I had the flu, but I was like, oh, well, I mean, I'm on the right path. It doesn't matter anymore. I'm, you know, I'm not stuck. And I kept doing that. And in fact, um, it's interesting because a really important moment for me was when I flew across the country to New Hope, Pennsylvania to meet these women I had been in the online writing class with. And I was so scared because, you know, everything was going to be kind of out of my control. I'd been doing this work for probably four months, um, but I was like, I'm ready. I hardly slept that whole time because I was like spending the night in a house with, you know, 12 people I'd never met. But I had the time of my life. It was so worth it. And I felt like that trip was like a reclaiming of my life and then um, just kept doing it to the point where I got back to really doing everything I want to do in life. And the symptoms subsided. I started sleeping well again. Um, there was, in addition to TMS, there was a piece that really did help with my sleep that was a, a cognitive behavioral therapy. There's a book called Say Goodnight to Insomnia by Greg Jacobs, which I think is really consistent with TMS theory. Um, and it's, it's just basically retraining your brain because insomnia is a learned behavior too. Mm -hmm. So you can just learn different behaviors to, to sleep. So that was really helpful. And then, yeah, within, you know, probably nine months, I was feeling, I was feeling great. And, you know, not just physically great. As you know, this gives you back your, your sense of vitality, meaning, um, self-empowerment was a big one for me to sort of take back. Because for me, I think with, with a trauma, you feel so disempowered. 
So I was never going to heal through a state of someone else saying, do this thing with your body I'm, that I'm going to tell you to do. It wasn't going to happen. I had to take back my power and say, no, this is through my thoughts, my emotions. I did a lot of work examining thoughts that were thinking I was maybe weak or fragile or things like that and just really turning them around um, into thoughts that were more empowering and that felt better. I would notice how do thoughts make me feel? And if they make me feel weaker or more contracted, they're not, not my truth. You know, I'll let those go and find thoughts and beliefs that feel stronger in my body, you know, feel safer. I like that phrase, let them go, because I talk a lot about becoming aware of the mental state. Yeah. And we can get into this mental state of a fearful merry-go-round of scary, dark, unbroken thoughts. And like you said, um, we can just choose to say, I don't have to believe that or take it seriously. I'm going to let them go. And we have so many thoughts a day that we can literally just let the ones that are not empowering, the ones that hold us down, the ones that say we're broken, we can just literally let them fly by at the speed of light because there's tens of thousands more coming today. And so we don't have to, we don't have to grab onto the dark and ugly ones and hold on to them and ruminate on them and repeat them all day long. But that's what exactly. we naturally do because yeah. again, yeah. if the brain perceives that these bad things are true, it's going to kind of habitually stay there in an effort to keep us safe. Right. We have that biological programming, but, but you're right. I also think of it like you do, like kind of, you see a bird in the sky, you can just let it fly by. And then when you start reconnecting to your emotions and physical sensations, i.e. symptoms in a safe way, you can connect how, <clears throat> how thoughts make you feel. And when thoughts are like consistently dragging you down, why would you want to keep thinking them? So that's why for me, like that somatic work and kind of becoming re reassociated in my body, I was pretty disassociated, <clears throat> um, was so important. And yeah. I think too, like then we get much more in touch with our gut instinct and our own intuition and so many other aspects of life when we're, we're rooted in our body. Yeah, I, I like um, pointing out how uh, Hannah Studley, do you know her? She has mm -hmm. a EMS group. So she's mm -hmm. always saying this, which is we are always feeling our thinking. Mm -hmm. right? And so I, love that. I like to take that and twist it a little bit and say, if you're feeling shitty, you're probably thinking shitty. Excuse the language. But yeah. it's kind of true. And that's why so much of the work I do with uh, my coaching clients is geared towards just becoming more aware of the mental state, the physical state, the emotional state, and a couple of, you know, gentle suggestions on what to do when those things are going off the rails a little bit. So, yeah, exactly. Because I, I do find for some people, it is more their thoughts, maybe they have a lot of self-pressure, or perfectionism, and they keep beating themselves up, and that sends signals to the, the brain, you're not safe. Um, with other people, like I think with me, I really did need to feel some of the, the emotions and like I said, just the, the symptoms in my body in this safe way to really retrain my brain that they're okay and it doesn't have to keep amplifying the signal because sure. I'm picking up on the signal, but I'm sending feedback that I'm safe, sure. that it's okay. And that sort of breaks that symptom stress cycle that you get caught in. For sure. Yeah. yeah. I, I also, as part of it, when I say you notice your emotional state be, becoming elevated, absolutely, it's time to feel them, right? Let's not sweep them under the carpet and try to make believe we're not angry or sad or upset or whatever. Um, yeah. But that also means we don't have to explode on the people around us because that's where a lot of us have learned that emotions are dangerous because last time I did that, it didn't go too well. So I better not do that again. So we think there's only two choices. So if I can't explode at the people around me, I better sweep it under the rug. And I'm like, no, there's a third choice. Feel it for yourself. Exactly. Feel the emotion. If yes. you want to cry, cry, do it in your bathroom, do it in your car, do it in your bedroom somewhere. Don't exactly. Because when you run away yeah. from emotions, they accumulate until, That's it. until they build up so much you do blow up at the people around you. And then that doesn't go well. And then it just reconfirms the brain, brain's belief that, 
emotions are dangerous. Right. Because, you know, most of us didn't have like a role model for healthy emotion. We may have seen people either blow up or repress. And so that becomes this habit. And you're right. Like it's what I found with myself is it's so important to create space for emotions. I was someone that grew up um, not really thinking emotions were very safe. And so that's, that's still kind of in my programming. So I like every day I create some space. It's usually just with some somatic meditation, but just to like allow any emotions to bubble up or, you know, if I am really angry, that's when journaling really works for me especially with anger. I would say journaling wasn't the main part of my healing, but if I'm really angry and I just like completely vent onto the page, you know, you get it out. Sometimes I'll just dance or shake or kind of move my body. And then you don't have to explode at the person. You generally don't have to do anything with the other person. But what I found is if we make space to feel and acknowledge our own emotions, if there is an action to be taken with someone else, like we do need to have a conversation or set a boundary, we're clear. We're in a state of empowerment and we're not, you know, coming out firing at them, sure. which just complicates it. Yeah, I call those uh, adult conversations. Yeah. <laughs> when you allow yourself, like you just said, to feel the emotion first, that adult conversation is going to go a heck of a lot better as opposed to coming in ready to explode or already exploding. So yes. feeling is always a really good idea, even if you have to have that adult conversation. So you said it in just slightly different words, but same exact message. That's cool. Yeah, you know, something I really liked, I did learn along the way is, is nonviolent communication. And that's telling someone how you feel. So I think too, as we acknowledge, well, I'm feeling scared or I'm feeling sad or I'm frustrated. Um, as we acknowledge that to ourselves. It can be a way we communicate to someone else where we're owning, this is how I feel, instead of just coming out, you did this, you did that. Um, everything's right, kind of coming from the inside out. And it, it just, it has such a positive effect on relationships, on everything you do in the world. I mean, all side effects from this work are positive, <laughs> right? It's just... Um, yeah, because it is because it is a journey of, of self exploration. I mean, there are those people who who read the book and and get better, but for the most part, I, I think Almost most like of that. us really just need need some some self exploration, and it's really satisfying because I've found whatever kind of got you into the symptoms will get you out of it. Right. In my case, I was really detached from my emotions. I used to live from the neck up. Um, I wasn't really picking up on signals that there there actually was danger in my environment because I was really detached oh, from sure. my emotional self. So for me, like I, I had to come back into that wholeness of being willing to feel emotions that were told are negative, but they're not. They're just part of the whole realm of being human, right? Exactly. Frustration, anger, sadness, and, and then that makes room for more peace and joy and some of this other spectrum. Um, so, yeah, so I found it was like coming back into the things that made me whole anyway, that makes life so much more satisfying to live. And that calms a nervous system, right? Because it sort of like knows, okay, she's on board. <laughs> she's present. She's picking up on these signals and... Um, Sending back some positive ones. Yeah, I talk a lot about creating consistent messages of safety so that the brain says they're doing okay. And I talk about the physical state. So if you're like this, the brain's not perceiving safety. They're perceiving mm -hmm. danger. Yes. And so if you're barely breathing and you're tight, the brain's not going to think you're safe. It's not going to settle down. It's always going to stay vigilant. You know, yes. if you are running away from your emotions and afraid of them. And I have heard people say directly to me, I am terrified of my emotions. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to have to shift that. Let's reframe this. Makes you human, not damaged. And in my case, I always, the example I give is I used to believe that if I got angry, I was a bleepity bleep like my dad. Yeah. And I never wanted to be like him. And so everybody's got these preconceived learned beliefs about themselves if they feel a certain emotion. I'm a bad person, I'm out of control, I'm mentally ill or whatever it may be. And it's not true at all. 
emotions are human. They're supposed to be felt. So that's a big part of teaching the brain that this thing called emotions are actually safe. How do you do it? By actually feeling them, not by running away from them and locking them in the basement. So exactly. That's what Sarno meant. Language just from different perspectives. So it's great. Oh, oh, I love these conversations. I, I geek out on this stuff. And, and I, you know, I'll say to people, when Sarno said, don't repress emotions, what's the opposite of that? Feel them, right? So I, yeah, I do think with some people that that can be a piece that they're missing if they don't just respond to the knowledge. And it can take creating like a safe environment to feel them just with yourself, with someone like you, Dan, um, if people feel they want to work with someone. Um, but just find the right environment to sort of open up that that aspect of yourself. Also, when people say, well, I can't feel any emotions, what I found is just starting to feel like the, the pain, the burning, the tingling, those different things in my body kind of like open the door to more anger, fear, um, you know, peace, joy, all those, those things. And they're very similar, really. I mean, symptoms and emotions are really similar. One's more sensory, one has more of an emotional quality, but, but we feel them in our body, right? right. That's why they're called feelings, because we yeah. actually feel them. I'm choked up. I've got a heavy heart, felt like a kick in the gut. We experience emotions physically. And if we I'm sick to my stomach, you know, I was on pins and needles. It's in all our language yes. that we have a certain experience and emotion comes and then we have a physical response. We're embarrassed and we blush or our palms get sweaty. And, you know, what I think people can accept like if, if they're upset, maybe they get a headache or they have insomnia. So it's really the same thing that's happening with these symptoms. It's just we kind of can get stuck in longer cycles. And, and then, of course, we have those learned neural pathways. And sure. fortunately, our brains are plastic and we can learn new things all the time and become, you know, who we're really meant to be. We just have to give the brain better instructions. Yes. So it can give us a yes. different output, because as long as we're giving it instructions that say, Oh my God, I'm broken. I'm never going to get better. I'm sick. I can't leave the house. I'm going to lose my house. I'm gonna, I can't even work. How am I going to pay for food? And all you're doing is running around the house freaking out or laying in bed freaking out for that matter. Yeah. Um, the brain's not getting any new information in which to make a shift. So one of my strongest phrases is nobody ever got better by freaking out. <laughs> Nobody. I love it. Ever. Nobody did because you're that reptilian brain just thinks you're in a state of danger and it creates symptoms to warn you. You know, yeah. yeah, a lot of it, too. And I'm sure that that you're doing this all day long, Dan, and I just so appreciate the work you do. It's so consistent. It's so solid. And you you share it with so much love um, So thank you for that. I find um, now, I, I, as you said, I'm a coach too. And so a lot of the people I work with have similar diagnoses because they can relate. And they're being told, oh, it's, it's high levels of Epstein-Barr. It's, it's high levels of Lyme. All these things I was told. Come to find out those are incidental findings too, just like a lot of the structural abnormalities. I've recently found studies that show a lot of asymptomatic people have high titers of Lyme or Epstein-Barr. I think it's happening with a lot more even than, you know, bulging discs or degenerative discs. So yeah, I really tell people I overcame it anyway, even though I had levels of Epstein-Barr that the doctor said they'd never seen before and all those scary things, it crossed into your brain. And it's like, didn't seem to matter. I got better anyway. <laughs> So a lot of it is is that education and kind of a re-educating people. And you're right, though, through this different accurate information that is a different paradigm in, in healing. And yeah, none of this is positive thinking and false hope. Mm -mm. This is accurate information about how the human body and the brain and the nervous system and the immune system, the digestive system, how it actually works. And when you realize that the body is designed to function optimally, yeah. it only starts to kind of go off the rails when it's got an 
overload of stress, tension, emotions, traumas, and the perception of danger, which you described earlier, is just like when the brain is completely terrified, it's hard for it to operate optimally. So it's our job to use the accurate information to teach the brain, okay, look around. We're, we're really not in danger. We're okay. And we all have that innate well-being inside of us. Uh, one of the quotes that came out in one of my group calls recently was somebody said, and they heard it from somebody else. I don't know who to credit it to, but they said, um, my body's handling this. I don't need to get involved. Yeah. Meaning, my brain doesn't need to get involved. Trust the body. It knows what to do. Give the brain better information so it can calm the heck down. And when the brain calms down, what happens? The nervous system calms down. When the nervous system calms down, all of these symptoms that have been like static electricity for years can start to like, oh, we're doing better. And yes, yes. You know, it, it's that's what it's about. It's, it's yeah. learning deciding that you're actually okay, you're not sick, you're not broken, you're not ill. You know, TMS or this mind-body stuff, people will say, okay, great, Dan, so you're telling me my body's not the problem. So that must mean I have a mental illness or I'm emotionally damaged. No, you're not that either. Mm. None of this, none mm. of it is our fault. It's just where we ended up. Exactly. It's this brain and the nervous system. I, I love how you put that because I really saw it as the brain's the master controller. And so when it gets the proper information and it can become aligned and regulated in the nervous system, it trickles down to all the other systems of the body. Digestion starts working better. Hormones start working better. Cardiovascular starts working better. It's true that it does, it has a trickle down effect. Maybe those other systems aren't working optimally, but not because something's wrong with them or wrong with those, those tissues themselves. Yeah. yeah. We just take in different information. Yeah. So you were talking about some of the gut diagnoses like leaky gut. Is that the problem or is that the result of this TMS? And I joke, it's TMS is too much stress. Combined with yeah. TMT, too much thinking. Combined with TMF, <laughs> which is too much fear. And yes. that creates nervous <laughs> system overload that symptoms start happening. But then we go get medicalized by the medical community and told we're broken. We're never going to get better, get used to it. And that just makes the whole thing overflow more. We're, yeah. We just keep on turning up the flame on the stovetop and this pot called the nervous system just keeps on boiling over. And yeah. so, so much of the things that Rebecca and I are talking about, the accurate knowledge, the application of that, the consistent messages to the brain, teaching the brain that the emotions are safe, the body is safe, that even our thoughts are safe, is going past that stove and dialing down the flame. And instead of it heating up and boiling over, this whole system can kind of come down to a simmer and then eventually cool off completely. And so that's where Rebecca is. She's cooled off completely. And if you experience any type of symptoms, I would imagine, correct me if I'm wrong, but your fear level is very, very low. Absolutely. You know, if there's a lot of stress, I'll get some symptoms. They're, they're mild, but um, generally it either goes to the little bit of fatigue or what I didn't even mention yet was interstitial cystitis also became a really big issue for me during these same years. Um, and so maybe I'll get, you know, a little bit of bladder spasming, but I know exactly what's happening. And if I don't, I just say, what's happening emotionally? So that was actually a practice that I started during these healing months with TMS is whenever I'd get a symptom or even fear or anxiety, I'd ask, what's happening emotionally? What's underneath that? Because there's always something. That's why the symptom's there. And so now I'll just ask that and I'll, I'll try to carve out a little time to be with that. Sometime all I have to do is say, oh, you know what? I'm, <laughs> the bladder stuff can be pissed off, right? When we, when we have to pee all the time. So um, 
Yeah, it's just, it's very simple, but it's coming back to the emotional level. So I don't go down any of those rabbit holes anymore. I mean, I haven't been to a doctor in years. At this point, you'd have to really convince me that something's physical. You know, I'd probably lean on the other side. And there are physical things with clients. I do say you you absolutely need to get checked and make sure it's not not yeah. physical. Um, but, you know, just just briefly on the interstitial cystitis, that one was was tricky because I had had urinary tract infections for years through my 20s and my 30s, and they were actual infections that had to be treated, mm-hmm. although I now see they also definitely had an emotional component. They linked back, unfortunately, to a, a previous sexual trauma when I was a teenager, um, and then I started getting UTIs. And so at some point, though, in the years of the chronic fatigue syndrome, I went to the doctor. I thought I had a UTI and they said, nope, there's no bacteria. And I was like, no, no, there really is. This is excruciating. It was like a nine out of 10, no bacteria. So then they start calling it interstitial cystitis and want to put a scope up there and medications, which I was going to have none of. Um, But I will say that that also went away with the TMS work. You know, and also with some of the emotional work, I, I do find a lot of women, I work primarily with women um, that have had a sexual trauma or something in their pelvic area. There, There's usually an emotional component that's linked to that. And so it can take some some processing that, writing about that, talking to someone, and mostly, like you say, just, just feeling, feeling what's present. Right. And then our body knows how to find balance. Yeah, so one of the things that I like to make sure people understand is while the emotions are absolutely part of it, likely why it all got started, many people have done therapy, they've done journaling, they've done all of the emotional work, and they're still not getting better. And it's causing them to doubt this whole mind body thing, because they're like, I, I've been doing emotional work for two years, I'm still no better. Why not? And it goes beyond just the emotions. Emotions are absolutely important. Allowing yourself to feel them is important, but we still have to teach the brain that the body's okay. So if you're on the fence, you still think there might be a physical problem or, you know, if you're still terrified of the symptoms, if you're terrified of your emotions and your brain and nervous system is constantly in that freak out mode, I don't care how well you journal and process your trauma with a therapist. We still have other things that are really equally important. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's a multifaceted problem and it's a multifaceted solution. And so that's why it's really important to get all of it handled. Yeah. And that's why, you know, Sarno called it knowledge therapy because you have to have that first. And then you're right. Then the other pieces, you kind of see what you need. Do you need more working with your thoughts and affirmations? Do you need more emotional work, more calming? The nervous system was helpful for me through meditation and breath work. Um, But yeah, you need that foundation and it's very, you know, personal. And I so appreciate Dan that you talk about this, the same concepts through a wide range of subjects and diagnoses, because I'll find myself sending your videos to clients. It's like, he talked exactly what you were just saying. And somehow when they hear it from someone else about whatever they're grappling with, whatever symptom or doubt, you know, it's just, yeah, it's really helpful. That's cool. Do you have anything else you'd like to share with the audience? Because it's a pretty big audience. Um, anything else you'd like to share? How can people get in touch with you? Yeah. Well, um, the best way is through my website. It's RebeccaTolin.com. So that's just R-E-B-E-C-C-A-T-O-L-I-N.com. You can sign up for a free somatic meditation on the website to sort of start to practice this if you're not already. Um, But really, I would just say to, you know, find your own sense of empowerment. And so on this healing journey, whatever gives you a sense of relief, peace, empowerment, self-compassion, that's your healing path. 
that's creating the grounds for healing. If you're doing things as a means to an end, like, oh, I have to eliminate 30 foods that I like and take 20 supplements a day just because this doctor told me, but I'm so frustrated. I'm so, you know, just contracted about that. Those aren't setting up the grounds for healing. You'll really know you're on the right path because you'll feel much more hopeful and empowered. And so with this TMS work, that's what it does. But it, it can, as you say a lot, Dan, it can take time. It can take practice. So don't give up if it's not working immediately. You know, keep going at it and see what that missing link is for you. And it will fall into place. And as soon as you start feeling safer and less scared of your body and your sensations, they will turn down in their own time. So we let go of the timeline and just let it all happen. I always say that the goal is to turn down fear of the symptoms, not to get rid of the symptoms. Yeah. And it's, it's definitely baby steps. Nobody is going to listen to this interview and tomorrow be like, I'm done. No fear. Honestly, I think the book cures are those freaks of nature who read a book and go, I'm fine. I'm not afraid. And they immediately get back to life and they like zero fear because, okay, here's an answer. This makes sense. Yeah. You know, a lot of people seem to think that those people end up with a symptom symptom imperative later that gets their attention otherwise. Yes. I think that definitely happens much of the time. That's it. And it can also be with people who didn't have a lot of stress or trauma in their life and they just needed a little bit better information. Yeah. Clarity. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. So listen, unless you've got anything else, uh, this was wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise, your experience, your journey with my audience. Um, Hopefully some people will resonate with you and reach out to you. And um, Mm -hmm. I don't know, I kind of view you as a uh, not competition but like friendly competition because the more of us that are out there, the more people are going to be able to hear about this stuff and get better. And it's, we'll yeah. just widen the entire audience even bigger and bigger and bigger. So I yeah. love, I love doing these calls, especially with somebody who's so passionate about your own experience that you're saying, this is what I'm now doing for a career because I am so passionate about helping people. And mm-hmm. honestly, I don't know too many EMS coaches, experts, therapists, doctors, even who have not gone through their own journey. Yeah, absolutely. You're not compelled to do this work. If you've never had any chronic symptoms, you're just going to find something else to do because it doesn't, it doesn't draw you in. It just lights you up. Yeah. I don't don't feel like I have any choice in the matter. Like this is what I have to do. And you feel the same, like forget news. I'm doing this. Oh, this is what matters to me. And, you know, I I feel honored to be in the same community as you, as, as a colleague. I so appreciate, um, yeah, everything you give. And we are working together. And it takes a village because I really see this as creating a new paradigm in understanding what's happening in our mind and our body. And in many ways, it's sort of a grassroots effort. Um but we take it back to doctors and family members and other people that we know, and, and it spreads. And you're spreading it in a big way. So I really appreciate the opportunity to, to meet you and to speak to your people. <laughs> this has been great. So yeah. thank you. I appreciate it. I'm sure people are going to love this conversation. Um, I'll let you know when it's up on the, on the web, but you'll see it show up. If you're just following along, you'll see it on Facebook and YouTube and um, you'll see it come up. It might take a few days to a week, but uh, for sure, it'll definitely get posted. And uh, thank you again. I really appreciate you, Rebecca. Thank you, Dan. Likewise. All right. Appreciate it.